put in this um, event. So as this works, and lots of you have already attended this event, um, we will listen to Francesca first, she will do her presentation, and then we will open the floor to questions and observation and a bit of debate, as you know. If you've got any questions, you don't want to forget that, you can make a note in your thing, or you can leave it on the message in the chat, and we will come back to that uh, when Francesca finishes. So Francesca, all to you. Thank you very much, Maria, and thank you to everyone uh, joining today. I just wanted to briefly say that I have a quite a bad cold, so this is not my normal voice. Uh, so you will just have to excuse me if I'm not at my best today, but I'll try. <laughs> um, so yes, as Maria rightly said, um, this paper that I'm presenting, this presentation today, is part of a bigger effort to sort of charter um, um, a sort of an alternative history of pride events that uh, uh, decenters Eurocentric and uh, US-centric perspectives. Uh, and it gives more a sort of space um, to uh, voices emerging from uh, the global south and also some peripheries of the global north. And uh, so the presentation today uh, really is a sort of critical questioning of the legacy of the Stonewall riots, the 1969 Stonewall riots. And um, it, it represents uh, one of the first theoretical chapters one of the theoretical chapters of my book and one that actually sort of lays the foundation for bigger conversations about what is pride politics today, um, how do we celebrate it, how do we sort of transpose it across, across different contexts and uh, different locales, and um, how do we make sense of uh, the legacy of the Stonewall riots. Um, so I'm planning to talk for around half an hour, 35 minutes, and then I will be more than happy to get questions from people uh, attending the seminar. Um, I'm going to start by sort of uh, giving you an overview of what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk briefly about four things. Um, I will be introducing the 1969 Stonewall riots and their significance. Um, I'm assuming that some of you may have uh, heard of the Stonewall riots already. Um, some of you may have not, so it's just a chance to sort of uh, situate um, the sort of the object of the discussion for the seminar. Um, the second, and then there's the three points that I will be developing. The first of, of which is the, the question of how the Stonewall riots are memorialized. So the process of memorialization and uh, the question of creating a, a historiography of queer history um, that is representative and uh, goes beyond those sort of uh, Europe, Eurocentric or Western centric uh, uh, tropes uh, about sexual and gender liberation or sexual and gender activism. The second point is that uh, building on the process of memor memorialization, it's a further step in this process of memorializing something, of an event that is considered to have a, um, um, a massive magnitude in, the, in LGBTQIA plus history, which is the process of mythologizing the Stonewall riots. So we don't just memorialize them, but we also mythologize them. So we create a, a, a myth enshrouding the Stonewall riots in a sort of cloak of mystery about their significance, but also the, the things that happened during that weekend. And, uh, you know, where I'm going to talk about how this mythologization of the Stonewall riots has productive effects on our creation of a, of a so-called global history of LGBTQIA plus social movements. And last but not least, I will be um, opening up the, the floor or the sort of horizon to alternative uh, uh, histories of activism that put into question the centrality of the Stonewall riots. Um, and I want to say that these are not exhaustive by any means. So there is way more examples that could be included in this uh, uh, sort of analysis. But obviously for questions of time and space, I've selected some cases that I think are more paradigmatic of what I'm, I'm trying to do with this chapter uh, or this paper. So this is more or less what I'm going to do in the next half an hour. Um, so uh, for those who don't know what the Stonewall riots are, um, uh, we're talking about the context of the US uh, at the end of the 1960s. 
and uh, we're talking about a long-standing history of police harassment and violence towards queer people, uh, particularly in public venues uh, that hosted um, gay men, gay women, um, um, trans uh, trans people, and gender non-conforming people um, across different uh, sort of um, um, identifications, um, and uh, also in intersectional terms in terms of their um, identities, in terms of their class or race. Um, so the reality of the situation, particularly at the end of the 1960s, was uh, one in which uh, um, New York had, uh, um, had a long-standing history of uh, um, refusing licenses to sell like liquor uh, to um, so-called homosexuals in bars. So there were bars uh, like dive bars, which uh, uh, didn't have a license to sell liquor, but you know provided liquor to pa patrons uh, on the down low or to sort of in a way that was not completely legal. And this often engendered uh, raids by the police. Obviously, this was not the sole reason. Um, there were also laws that uh, particularly uh, targeted people who were wearing items of clothing that were not conforming to the sex that they uh, were perceived to be. Uh, so, you know, the rule was that you had to uh, wear at least three items of the gender or sex that you uh, were sort of perceived to be in, uh, in order not to be uh, become target of the police. Um, so we are saying that obviously there is a long standing history of this police harassment and violence. Uh, police uh, used to uh, sort of barge into the bars and uh, uh, sort of uh, arrest or uh, ask for IDs or sometimes confiscate the earnings of the bar, sometimes uh, confiscating the liquor or um, harassing the patrons uh, uh, with the homophobic or transphobic slurs. Um, and on a particular weekend in June uh, 20, uh, 1969, uh, some people were at the famous now Stonewall Inn, which was uh, effectively not a particularly nice bar. It was a mafia owned bar, like many of the bars that were actually um, catering for uh, gay and uh, trans and gender non-conforming patrons. And um, there was a particular um, uh, configuration that night of the type of police intervention that happened because it wasn't necessarily the um, um, sixth precinct that uh, used to carry out the raids, uh, but it was a different division of the NYPD that went to the Stonewall Bar, uh, Stonewall Inn that night. Um, this may, meant that the, um, um, the owners of the bar did not get uh, um, tipped off by the police. They usually were tipped off by the police before the police arriving, so to minimize the sort of impact of the arrests. Um, but that night, it was a particularly uh, different configuration that led to the fact that patrons were severely harassed by the first division of the NYPD, rather than just having that sort of uh, slap on the wrist that they would normally have uh, uh, when the lights would go on uh, and the police uh, barged into the bar. So this created a sort of disconcert in the um, um, patrons that were there. Um, and although they were used to police harassment in these public venues, you know, the crowd inside the venue started to pour out in the streets and um, sort of protesting and chanting uh, in a way that was later configured as a riot because it lasted well into the weekend. Now, what is important to um, discuss in relation to the Stonewall riots is uh, that uh, there's a lot of, as I was saying, there's a lot of mystery around uh, uh, the exact facts that went on that night. Um, although there is uh, quite a robust uh, strand of uh, uh, scholar, historical scholarship, um, there's also some uh, um, sort of, um, there's some discrepancy in relation to uh, some elements that would help uh, historians to precisely acknowledge or reconstruct what happened. In particular, there are different versions uh, from different people who were present or witnesses of that night about who was present during the raid, so which people or historical figures of the LGBTQIA plus communities were effectively on site. Um, there were, there's also controversies or discrepancies around why people per decided to resist that particular event. I mean, there is a, a sort of rumor going on about the fact that, for instance, uh, 
on that day. Um, it was the, the coincidence was that uh, Judy Garland had her funeral and some people thought that that was something that triggered the crowd. And obviously, you know, there's historians who debate that has been quite a trivial motivation for something as serious as police harassment. And also the last um, sort of probably the most um, um, sort of trivial of all these discussions is uh, what triggered the, the riot in terms of what was the object that triggered or started the riot itself. And as you can see, I've put some of the possible objects that have been uh, uh, sort of uh, identified uh, in different uh, versions about, you know, it was a brick that started the riots, or it was a shot glass, or it was a, a stiletto heel or a stone of some sort. So the, the riots themselves, although no one disputes that they happen, there are some elements in the narrative that can be sort of um, that are remain disputable or remain contested in uh, mainstream historiography of these events. Um, and I wanted to sort of foreground the conversation uh, about the sort of a critical approach to the Stonewall riots by um, saying up, up front that the Stonewall riots are effectively considered to be the genesis of all Pride events. So we wouldn't think about uh, Pride events in the way we think about them today unless we had that remembrance, that memory, that blueprint of the Stonewall riot and the ensuing commemoration that happened in uh, uh, 1970 in uh, uh, New York and in other cities. So I've put here the, a quote by the ex-chairman of Amsterdam Pride, and he's the ex-chairman because he then was, had to resign because of um, allegations of racist um, uh, racist statements. Uh, but, you know, effectively, I feel like this, uh, is, this is effectively a problematic statement and says all the pride that we have in the world, it started here, meaning at Stonewall. We are standing on the shoulders of the people who were here. And the Hoofnagel said this on occasion of the 50th anniversary of Stonewall in New York City uh, to sort of say, you know, we are all indebted to those who uh, rioted on those nights and uh, those who then commemorated the riots a year after in um, in New York, in, in Los Angeles and elsewhere as it happened. So there is this narrative that uh, is, uh, has become even more entrenched with the 50th anniversary that was celebrated in 2019 about the Stonewall riots as really being the, the birth um the birth moment or the originator of all uh, lgbt history so and not just that but also they're considered to be what we call a, a watershed moment a moment where there is almost a, an, a pre and post stonewall meaning that everything that has come before stonewall become somehow erased or overwhelmed, over sort of overshadowed by the magnitude of these events of the of the riots. Um, and it's true that after, you know, um, we saw this with the commemoration of the 50th year, uh, since the Stonewall riots, if you know, if you look at the press, if you look at uh, commemorative um, events or discussions, roundtables, um, other forms of scholarly and non-scholarly interventions that have pointed out how much uh, the Stonewall riots still represent an important element of inspiration for a lot of activists who would uh, incorporate uh, the Stonewall narrative in some of their events or in some of their celebrations. But at the same time, I have a, a sort of an ease uh, and I'm not the only one. I mean, what I'm presenting to some measure, it's not uh, entirely original in the sense that other scholars have already pointed out uh, what some of the things that we'll be saying today. So to my unease comes from the fact that I find it hard to retrace or I find it hard to convince myself that it's OK to retrace the entire genealogy of social and political resistance at the global scale. So we're talking at the scale of um, different countries across different locations to one single point of origin that is located not just in the global north, but in the US. So in a um, particularly um, uh, within a particularly hegemonic uh, context of uh, gender and sexual uh, discourses. Um, 
that have some sort of ramifications as well um, that are in terms of uh, projecting both uh, homo-colonial and homo-nationalist discourses as Huang, Huang has uh, argued. So this idea that um, Stonewall is the sort of beacon of light for everyone in the world to take notice of and to get inspired from. So it's exactly that that I want to problematize a little bit more in my presentation. And this doesn't discount the fact, of course, that in themselves the Stonewall riots were important or they were relevant and people who fought against the police were brave. Um, but it, it's important not to um, reduce uh, all the history of LGBT social movements to that single point in time. So there's a couple of approaches that usually we could uh, use. Uh, the first one is the idea, as we sa were saying earlier, of the singular origin of LGBTQIA plus activism, that all activists in the world today stand on the shoulders of the pioneers of uh, uh, Stonewall. So this idea that Stonewall, um, the Stonewall riots uh, created a sort of big bang of LGBTQI plus activism, and it kind of they occurred in a historical vacuum as if nothing happened or nothing existed prior to, or no one had ever tried to resist police brutality or police harassment. And uh, they kind of like spread like wildfire, this metaphor of wildfire spreading that Armstrong and Craig use in their paper. Or there is a different approach which shows that the modern, what we call the modern LGBTQI plus um, movement or activism is more the result of a series of stratifications of different activities, networks, relationships, sometimes also conflicts that arise dif among different actors, and also groups that are either strongly connected, but sometimes loosely affiliated with each other across different spatial and temporal dimensions. So within or uh, beyond the global north and you know within and beyond the global south. Um, so there, these are two approaches that we can use. And in this uh, paper, in this presentation, I'm, I am um, sort of thinking of using the second, of course. So why do we need a, a critical approach to the Stonewall riots? As I said, although we want to celebrate the Stonewall riots for what they were, or that is a show, a showing or a, a manifestation of strength and solidarity and um, activism, we also need to uh, contextualize them in relation to global geographies of gender and sexuality. So we cannot just focus our attention on one point on the map, which is New York City in order to understand global trends of LGBT activism, LGBTQI plus activism. And uh, we need to be aware of uh, that the fact that if we put the spotlight on Stonewall, what we're doing, we are um, creating an, epistemo an epistemological problem in terms of accessing narratives that are not as spectacularized, they're not as popular, they're not as known as the Stonewall riots themselves. And this creates a situation also of subalternity in terms of which voices are heard and which voices are rendered invisible. <coughs> Pardon me, sorry. So, <clears throat> For me, some of the questions that I tried to raise with my um, research, this was particularly a sort of like a review of the literature, a bit of a historiographic uh, research for this uh, particular chapter, is the first question is how do we memorialize key moments in the history of the LGBTQI mo movement on a global scale? So, so how do we decide what counts? The second is who is in charge of this process of memorialization? Because as we know, knowledge is power, and therefore, those who have the knowledge, those who have the archives, those who have the pictures, those who have the witnesses, uh, mem um, memoirs, or those who can write those memoirs are the ones who probably lead the conversation. And last but not least, what productive effects uh, the importance of the Stonewall riots have on our understanding of what we call modern uh, identities of gender and sexual diversity, particularly when we think about transposing these models of identities across the globe, such as, you know, with the proliferation of pride events. So these are some of the questions that are asked uh, in, uh, in the context of this presentation. So let me start with the process of memorialization of pride, uh, oh, sorry, of pride, oh, the 19, 1969 Stonewall riots. Um, there is a, um, in um, his, 
historiographical research or historical research on the LGBT movement, particularly US-based, uh, particularly up to the um, early 2000s. There is this uh, um, central preoccupation with uh, what Kisak has called the deconstruction of the Stonewall narrative to sort of like unpack what happened at Stonewall, who was there, where, what was the reality, what was the truth, what is the myth, what is the fiction. So a lot of historians, of queer historians, have grappled with these ideas. We have a lot of contributions that are now considered to be classics of this historiographical uh, work, such as uh, Carter, Emilio Duberman, Marcus or River to cite a few if you you know if you're interested in for instance knowing what happened who was there who you know allegedly who shot who, who threw the first glass or the first brick all of this conversation all of these um, um, testimonies uh, uh, documents um, uh, leaflet pamphlets um, have all been sort of uh, um, collected studied and uh, they form now part of a um, sort of long-standing effort to create what you know scholars call the sort of the history of the LGBT movement. And this is also coherent with the fact sort of it's uh, um, not coherent, but it's relevant in relation to the fact that very often because of criminalization of homosexuality in some context, the US included, um, um, documents on queer uh, experiences are non-existent or well destroyed or made invisible. So it is understandable that historians want to create a so-called history of LGBTQIA plus communities. However, this mainstream uh, uh, historiography, so this effort of memorializing um, the Stonewall riots has two, a twofold effect uh, that is particularly visible, uh, particularly creates two forms of what we call invisibility. First of all, Stein has argued that this focus on the Stonewall riots effectively has invisibilized the network of resistance that existed beyond the context of New York City. So it existed particularly in um, also on the West Coast, uh, the North, uh, the Northwest, the Pacific Northwest, but also the American South, the US South. Uh, but this also goes beyond, you know, the geographical spread of resistance against police brutality. And also the second form of invisibility that this historiography very often reproduces is uh, it erases the experiences of uh, cis queer women, particularly lesbian women, trans people, people of color, and also disabled people. Although less research has been done on the uh, marginalization of disabled people in the context of post Stonewall politics. Uh, there is a little bit, but you know, obviously um, not as much uh, uh, as uh, we may want to. Um, so in particular, you know, there's uh, some historians who have tried to bring back some attention on this aspect. And, um, you know, the, um, for instance, you know, relationships with the Black Panther Party um, come strongly into play, particularly the, uh, in the aftermath of the Stonewall riots with the um, tensions and disagreements with uh, um, some of the leaders of the Black Panther parties and sort of attempts to create solidarity with the Gay Liberation Front, which was the movement that was funded as a result of the, um, so after the Stonewall riots. Um, but also, for instance, in, you know, when we, we want to to sort of think about uh, lesbian women in particular. Um, uh, historians, Kisak, for instance, shows us that lesbian women were ostracized within the Gay Liberation Front for a double sort of jeopardy you know, in a way, having been women, so you know, not uh, being um, men, uh, but also uh, because of their, so in terms of like misogynist politics of the Gay Liberation Front, but also because of their sexual orientation. So there was a, a, a both lesbophobia and misogyny at play there. And an interesting uh, also marginalization uh, occurred towards uh, um, disabled people back in the, in at the moment where the Gay Liberation Front was created, because the, up to that point, before the Stonewall riots, the mainstream narratives that activists, gay activists were trying to fight was the question of defining homosexuality as a sickness. So the moment that the, the discourse changed with the Stonewall riots and this idea of combating this idea of sickness, homosexuality as sickness, the Gay Liberation Front and gay activists more in general tried to distance themselves from those who they perceived to be Sick, so they didn't want to be to be associated with uh, disability activists, and as you can imagine, this is 
creates uh, 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 intersectional marginalizations at various points uh, uh, along the gender, race, uh, um, and uh, uh, disability. So, you know, this is the kind of aspects of the historiography of the Stonewall riots that sometimes we need to uh, acknowledge. And more broadly, we have discussions, I mean, scholars have had discussions on what they call the cis washing and whitewashing of Stonewall. So this idea that uh, to make a Stonewall palatable or to create these sort of seamless narratives, we create this idea of Stonewall as led by white middle class uh, uh, cisgender men. An example of this uh, process was the 2015 uh, movie Stonewall made by Roland Emery, uh, where the leading character, the one who allegedly threw the first brick, was effectively a white uh, cisgender man, as you can see from the picture on the uh, uh, right corner, upper right corner. But there's also questions, for instance, that has been thrown um, in relation to the participation of some key figures, particularly trans activists of color, particularly um, the role of uh, Silvia Rivera, uh, who was a Puerto Rican Venezuelan um, trans uh, woman who was also created of STAR, which is a, was a um, refuge for trans uh, people. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of historians have debated whether Silvia Rivera was effectively at Stonewall that night. And it's interesting that her credibility is put into question um, because obviously, uh, as a um, person who was disenfranchised within the movement uh, uh, itself, uh, this, you know, it's, it's her participation or her unreliability is seen as being a, um, sort of um, um, a lack, a lacking legitimation of her words. And so, some historians, particularly historians who've tried to focus on um, narratives of uh, um, Latinas. Um, participants to um, the Stonewall riots. Uh, uh, for instance, you know, we have a broader conversations about the role of testimonials, for instance, for um, uh, those who witness uh, events that are so uh, poignant and abject uh, that don't have just a significance for themselves, but their whole communities. So in a way, it doesn't matter that much if Rivera was there, as what is matters is the narrative that she is embodying for all of those Latinas that were um, um, persecuted for their gender nonconformity or their sexuality or their class uh, or intersection with their class at that particular historical point. Um, but, you know, there is a question of ownership or who is in charge of memorializing. And I've put here a quote by Mark Stigal, who was uh, present at the Stonewall riots and is also an activist and a journalist. And uh, he doesn't mean his words in his memoir. He says it has been over 40 years since the Gay Liberation Front first took trans seriously. But the gay men who wore those shirts with the polo players or alligator emblems didn't want trans people as the representation of their community. Their revisionist history has been accepted into popular culture because they were the ones with connection to the publishers, the influence, as well as the money and time to sit back about what really happened. So, you know, what Mark Siegel is saying effectively is who is in charge of this process of memorialization. So if we think that Silvia Rivera is not reliable, what we are thinking as being reliable is are the memories of those particularly white cisgender middle class gay activists who had the time and the money to sit down with publishers or ghostwriters or interviewers and uh, give their version of the events. But the question, so the question of memorialization is effectively an epistemological question and it raises, it echoes the concerns that Linda Tuhi Wise Smith has raised in relation to how it's important to decolonize epistemological approaches to knowledge production, particularly in the way in which we use history. So what is history for? And what version of history are we using in order to justify a teleological narrative? So it's um, not just about uh, you know what happened, who threw the first brick, or what is true and what is not. It's also about the way in which narrate the story has specific uh, effects, uh, productive effects uh, on uh, activists in the sense that uh, the history of Stonewall that is narrated is a history from which activists uh, tend to draw some lessons or tend to plan some strategies. So in light of what has happened at Stonewall, they might think about what they may have to do in their particular context. And that, of course, is a productive effect, because obviously the way in which we narrate the, histo the history of the Stonewall riots raises questions on what is the future of the movement if this is the, the 
the point of origin from which we all allegedly come from as queer people. The second point that I wanted to raise uh, and is in relation to a further step down the line. So mem memorialization is the first step in the production of uh, historical knowledge about Stonewall. The second step is effectively an elevation to a almost uh, um, untouchable status. I mean, I have had uh, myself uh, while I was writing this uh, this paper, uh, from which um, on which I based this present uh, this, this presentation, I had qualms myself about not coming across as uh, this this uh, sort of dismantling or being disrespectful to the story of the Stonewall riots. Uh, but you know, um, scholars have asked themselves, for instance, why has this have the Stonewall riots become so crucial? Why are they so what's so special about them? And some some authors, particularly Armstrong and Craig, have written this seminal paper in 2006 uh, about you know memory and the myth of Stonewall, and they argue that Stonewall became the the event not because it was particularly different from any other event, but because it came at a moment at which the, the sort of gay movement more broadly had acquired enough capacity to be able to exploit what happened in order to make it a, a commemorable event. So it wasn't that uh, the Stonewall riots were way more significant than other forms of harassment, for instance, the Compton uh, cafeteria riots in San, Fran in San Francisco of 66, uh, or others, you know, the raid at the Black Cat Cafe. Uh, but it was because the activists were able to mobilize in a way that made the, those events uh, transformed or transfigured into an event that could bear uh, sort of a commemorative element, which was effectively the creation of the first Pride Parade in 1970. But also, uh, activists also had that sort of ca capital to also intervene in the production of history. For instance, uh, there is a, a lot of discussions around the role of particular activists, particularly, you know, we can think about Craig Rodwell, of how knowledgeable he was about the world of the New York press and how he was one of the people who called the press at the Stonewall uh, in that night. So it's not just serendipity that uh, the Stonewall riots became uh, the pivotal moment in US uh, uh, queer history. It was because of resource, you know, if you want to resources or also political opportunities, you know, the mix of the two, if we want to use a, a social movement theory framing. But you know why is it important to talk about the Stonewall myth? I mean, um, it's now a formula that has been used by a lot of scholars. I mean, I found the several instances across different countries, uh, across different languages as well, of this idea of this trope or this construct of the Stonewall myth. And um, it's not a coincidence that people or scholars use this word. I mean, it's not used uh, as uh, um, sort of like one word. Um, that is exchangeable with another. Some of the authors use it in a slightly sarcastic way or in a slightly polemical way because they want to point out the fact that this myth is in effect uh, um, an exaggeration or um, an over-reliance on a form of, uh, uh, of a construction of an epic ancestral point of origin that it seems to, is assumed to encompass every form of activism. Um, or across the globe. Um, so similarly to the process of memorialization, the process of mythologization see, has similar productive elements because it creates this idea that uh, Stonewall is uh, the sort of big bang of LGBTQI plus movements and one that has to, a moment that has to be revered and known and celebrated across the globe. Um, I, I used uh, some of the work of uh, Bart to understand a little bit how the Stonewall myth is cre has been created. And if you're familiar with Bart um, as a semiotician, he talks about the myth in his book, Mythologies, as a discourse of form of speech that requires a certain level of preparation. So the myth has uh, to be constructed in a certain way. And uh, he uses the sort of uh, triad of signifier, signified, and sign. And he says that the myth arises in a, form, in a staggered way. So the creation of a sign, a sign is then used uh, through the signifier and the signified 
is the sign itself then becomes the signifier that is associated to another signified and in turn it creates another sign so the creation of the myth is one that drives away that sort of operates a sort of sliding of meaning so the meaning of the original meaning slides through to the point of being acquiring an essence or an identity of itself so just to give you an illustration of what I mean by that, um, I, I use the example of the famous brick. So who threw the first brick at Stonewall uh, against the police? So, you know, here we use the first brick at Stonewall as the signifier. So the signifier uh, of the brick itself, which and the signified in this case is how LGBTQ people fought against the police. So in itself, the brick and the signified, the signifier and the signified create this new sign which is lgbtqi people fight against the police in order for this sign to be elevated to the rank of myth it has to be associated with a new signified so the sea sign itself the fact that lgbtqi people fought against the police is not just about fighting it's not just a, a riot but it is elevated it signifies something else It's a signifier for gay liberation so when we associate the fact that lgbtqi people fought the police with the bigger concept of gay liberation then we get this assemblage of signifier and signified then morph into this myth as a key moment in LGBTQI history. And um, this is produced through what uh, Barth says, it's uh, uh, taming the richness of the signifier. So the signifier of uh, um, fighting against the police uh, is lost, you know, the richness of the motivations, the richness of why people did that, what were the, the particularly con conjunctural uh, points of, as I said, the motivations that the the sort of um, issues that arose that allowed the stonewall to become significant but also it naturalizes meaning so it creates this impression that stonewall is a natural point where queer history is born as i said a sort of birth a, a natural origin and um so it's sort of like the idea of the myth that sort of uh, shows that there is a, an artificial creation uh, the example that um, Barth originally uses in his book is the, the creation of the myth of French imperiality, for instance, you know, how do we get from a picture of a young black soldier saluting the French flag to the myth of French imperiality. So we can do a similar discourse for the LGBT, uh, so for the Stonewall riots, of course, so two very different planes of uh, signification. Uh, but also, you know, the myth creates these ideas that, you know, are very important in what we, uh, you know, we have seen with Foucault, the idea of the modern homosexual. So the, the Stonewall riots are the entrance into modernity. The myth of um, the Stonewall myth is also the myth of entrance into modernity. Um, and another important uh, consequence that a lot of historians have looked at is the fact that the elevation of the Stonewall riots at, at this paradigmatic moment in queer history means that there is a pre and post era which uh, creates uh, you know this dichotomy between oppression and uh, liberation as if uh, all queer people before Stonewall were uh, just uniformly oppressed but also you know it creates some uh, sort of specular myths which are the myth of isolation invisibility and internalization of uh, homophobia that existed pre-stonewall so the myth itself is productive not just in what it creates in terms of uh, the narrative of Stonewall itself, but it also projects ideas about modernity. It projects ideas about he queer history and who is uh, left uh, out of queer history, who is uh, pre-modern or who is uh, still living in the myth, in the pre-Stonewall uh, myth. So we have two uh, options when we think about, you know, sort of uh, uh, decentering the Stonewall riots. We can either multiplying the meanings. So as I said, including uh, black narratives on the Stonewall riots, trans narratives, disabled narratives, lesbian, bisexual narratives, in order to broaden the field and the experiences of people who participated. Or we can also decide to decenter uh, the Stonewall riots. So as Bravman says. Uh, history is really a question of univocality. So, you know, instead of uh, developing one gay theory, 
we should effectively develop complete competing and complementary theories in order to analyze how different queer pasts emerge and sometimes they overlap and sometimes they won't and this brings me to uh, sort of some examples that uh, can help us do that uh, to sort of not to forget the Stonewall riots but to resize their importance compared to a global um, arena where other things were happening beyond the horizon of the US. So a lot of uh, um, literature has been produced in uh, Spanish and Portuguese, uh, as well as in English um, from Central and Latin America. And I think that is the most, it's the biggest bulk of research that has been done on the legacy of the Stonewall riots in uh, outside of the US, one of the biggest. And uh, it's interesting that many, in many uh, authors' work, uh, we're talking about Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, El Salvador, um, um, Mexico. Um, there's also always this questioning of why are we given for granted that Stonewall is also our moment in history? And in particular, when it comes to um, the, the uh, countries in Latin, Central and Latin America where that were experiencing civil war, such as El Salvador, or countries that were exper experiencing dictatorships, such as Colombia, Brazil, or Argentina, you see that a lot of the preoccupations of the local movements at the time, particularly um, towards the end of the 70s, in some cases later, in the case of El Salvador, wasn't really with the Stonewall riots. The Stonewall riots was something that wasn't necessarily seen as being relevant to the struggles of the activists back then. And also it was a story that did not necessarily intersect with the political interests of those movements, particularly because a lot of uh, LGBT movements in uh, Central Latin America, thinking particularly about Mexico, Colombia, um, but also Brazil, were strongly aligned with left-wing parties, either of socialist or communist extraction. And also in the context of the Cold War, Solidarity with North American uh, or US based um, activists was not seen as desirable, or it was seen as a sort of ideologically not uh, very easily reconcilable. Um, but there's also the question of, uh, um, you know, questions around colonization and uh, uh, other forms of uh, belonging that become more pertinent in, in some contexts rather than other. And pain, for instance, has a uh, uh, shown that in the context of uh, um, pride in Me particular pride in Mexico, in the city of Chilpancingo, in the state of Guerrero, and the sort of iconography, the um, references, the um, ideas are about pride are, have more to do with religious uh, traditions and civil tra civic traditions around uh, public demonstrations and public processions that they have to do with the repertoire of international sort of rainbow uh, pride um, um, sort of uh, activism. Uh, but also there's this integration of uh, uh, some forms of anti-colonial resistance in the context of the parade, for instance, with the um, sort of parading of the Chinelo dancers who were was of which da who dance in a sort of a, in a way to mock the colonized the European white colonizers. So you know this is one of the examples, and there's way more um, to be said about Latin America. Obviously, I'm not doing justice to um, a huge variety, a huge richness of uh, uh, difference that different countries offer. Another important example in uh, sort of decentering Stonewall is the case of South Africa with the creation of GLOW by uh, Simon Tsekon Kohli but in, in, at the end of uh, uh, the 80s um, and in the context of the sort of crumbling of the apartheid, of course, of the apartheid regime. And his movement, although there were other organizations um, for gay liberation in South Africa, uh, as a black man, um, Kohli was a... Um, crucial in the creation of the first Johannesburg, Johannesburg Pride in 1990. And what makes uh, the uh, first Pride March interesting is from, uh, this idea, from the perspective of decentering Stonewall is that there was a strong narrative, a, a strong sort of adherence to the tradition of anti-apartheid marches in the first march. So it wasn't just about mimicking marches that had happened, pride marches that had happened elsewhere. And this is sort of uh, 
um, autochthonous character of the march was also uh, symbolized by uh, the use of traditional paint painted banners or, for instance, the use of the ANC flag, the African National Congress uh, flag, party flag that had been banned during the apartheid regime. And, uh, um, you know, it, so these are some of the examples, you know, in the in the chapter that I've written, I also talk about uh, um, the Philippines and uh, uh, Japan, but also some countries within Europe, such as uh, uh, Spain, Portugal, uh, the Netherlands, Denmark, um, Austria, because they all have uh, started to question their own uh, reliance on the Stonewall myth and what it does for them. And I thought that I would include, and I'm I'm going to finish now. Um, the um, the words of uh, um, one of the scholars, the Brazilian scholars, who have, has written about you know this problematic relationship with uh, uh, Stonewall. So Da Costa Jr. says uh, it is fundamental to ask ourselves for which reason this movement, Stonewall, is recognized as the event that marked and changed our history. The fight of white gays, who were also in many cases middle class, who occupied a bar in Manhattan, is a capable of representing. Latin American homosexuals who, in the same decades, were resisting political persecution during the civil military dictatorship in the countries of the southern corn, cone, for instance. So he asks, uh, how is that we make Stonewall our sort of pivotal moment when we were challenged in very different ways. So the last thing I want to um, uh, um, sort of add to this conversation is the question of uh, the Stonewall metaphor. If you have seen uh, you know, local histories in particular countries about what happened uh, in, I don't know, Brazil or Italy or Spain, at some point historians would start saying, oh, this uh, particular event was the Italian Stonewall or was the Brazilian Stonewall. And this is also something that we should probably problematize because to create this sort of watershed mentality, this idea that we need to have a stone wall wherever we go, is a way to ask uh, um, activists to produce a history that maybe doesn't fit their own narratives. And there is a particularly interesting paper by Aron Descartes who questions whether he should actually produce this uh, stone wall moment for the context of South Asia. And he decides to refuse to create this uh, genealogy in order to subtract himself to this uh, productive request uh, from, the, from the global north. So I'm just going to finish here. Sorry, it, it took a little bit longer than I thought. Um, so I think that you know, if we want to uh, really create uh, uh, or really embark on a global history of LGBTQI mo uh, movements, we need to overcome, overcome both the Stonewall myth and the Stonewall metaphor, and to create, try and create inclusive and critical accounts of uh, social movement histories based on sexual and gender diversity. So we need to beyond think beyond the, the received notion of what is pride or what is the history of pride, and understand that sometimes LGBTQI activism cannot mold itself to fit the pre-constituted mold of the historical legacy of the Stonewall riots. So thank you very much and uh, thank you for the patience of listening to me. And I'm done. <laughs> oh, that was fascinating. Can you all hear me well? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, hi. Thank you. Because I'm using my, because I'm using my um, headphones now. Thank you, Francesca. Um, that was fascinating. Um, and I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure colleagues have lots of questions. Um, it's very, very interesting, your presentation. Thank you so much. I took so, um, so many notes, um, lots of notes. Um, but I'm just um, letting um, Helton to jump and ask his questions. For the rest, just um, let your comments in the chat if you um, if you don't want to connect your mic or connect your mic and um, and post your question to um, Francesca. So Helton, go ahead with your question. Okay, uh, I'd like to salute uh, Francesca for such a, an interesting presentation. I think everybody is really <laughs> at all, really so, so much information here uh, share in such a, a short uh, period of time. But it's a really straightforward question, Francesca. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you considered the role of the AIDS crisis for settling the uh, pride in Stonewall myths? Because as we know, like 
for instance, uh, many identities were formed after the 90s, the invention of the LGBT acronym, the 90s, everything came um, after um, the uh, the terrible uh, developments of the, the, uh, the AIDS crisis in the, in the 80s, in the 90s. So there's a lot of coalition making and that pride could come up to, um, to suffice to this kind of um, coalition call. So have you, have you ever thought about it? Just if you, if you haven't, there's no problem. just to brainstorm a little mm -hmm. bit more to, as you said about histor uh, making a historiography or a drawing a history. Yeah. So I think it's important to link to that. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for this question. Um, I, obviously, I mean, it doesn't capture, uh, this is a chapter that has now become 10,000 words, which I will have to trim uh, because, you know, it's gone all over my uh, expectations. But I have another chapter where I will analyze coalitions and conflicts uh, within the LGBT movements and the sort of history of that. Um, because obviously there is a, there are a lot of points of contacts and a lot of conflicts as you know we know, for instance, uh, even at the outset uh, of the Stonewall riots, there were already rifts uh, very, very, very deep. Um, so I think, you know, and also you mentioned the AIDS crisis, and I think it's also important to acknowledge that that was a complete change in the way in which relations, relations between different segments of uh, the movements, uh, not just in the US, across the globe, uh, um, um, happened also uh, according to, you know, in relation to histories of global health and uh, sexual health, and also what comes with that idea of uh, um, the sort of um, the divide between the, the global north and the global south when it comes to HIV and AIDS prevention as well. Um, so yeah, so that's a very, very relevant point. Thank you for raising it, Elton. I think people are muted. People who want to talk are muted. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. I'm muted. I myself am there. <laughs> Cohen, did you want to pose your question? Thank you. Yes, please. Um, hi, Francesca. Uh, thanks for uh, what is a very fascinating talk. Um, I have many questions, but I, I'll, I'll stick with a couple of uh, them if I'm allowed to. Um, I just was wondering, like, when you're talking about the uh, memorialization, the mythification, um, I was wondering whether you could clarify better about who is doing this work, because I think there is a lot of talk about scholars who are doing this work, but then equally, I think um, a lot of these things have, are not necessarily done in scholarship. And I think, for example, uh, the mythologization started immediately in, during the event by the activists who were doing all that work already. I mean, you, as, as Armstrong and Craig uh, very clearly also write about. And then I think also um, there is this kind of vicious cycle that seems to be much more kind of going. Um, so that's a kind of one question, if you could clarify where you see the who is doing the work yeah. and for what purposes. And then I think the other question goes to the agency of to, of global south actors or non-european actors who embrace the idea of the stonewall myth or embrace mm -hmm. the idea of the stonewall metaphor because i think you know you say oh historians are point, pinpointing when this is the it, italian stonewall but it's not it's not always done by historians it's done by activists in the moment if i look at the serbian history when the 2001 belgrade pride happened um one of the organizers he said uh, to international community like this is the serbian stonewall right and then similarly when 2013 midnight right happened again he was said this is our stonewall moment and i think th this this um kind of moves have political pur purchase right and i think um what i guess those are the two questions i will I'll, yeah. I, I think it's already a lot <laughs> Um, thank you. So for the first, I think that, uh, I mean, there's a bitter um, rift between different gay and lesbian historians. I'm going to call them gay and lesbian because they are the sort of like that tradition of his, his history that was probably developed during the 80s and 90s, okay, in the years 2000, who are trying to pin down who was there, who wasn't there. And I'm talking people such as Carter, Duberman, um, 
and others river so there is some of them they are quite bitter about or quite uh, strict about what they think the official version of the Stonewall riots should be. Um, and that's why I said that the process of memorialization very often is also, I mean, I, I, I can add, is a, is a process of gatekeeping. And that's also why the figure of Silvia Rivera becomes so pivotal in this understanding, because of obviously it's a contested figure, because some historians, they have this debate of whether she was really there or not, whether she just arrived, rocked up uh, hours, hours later. Um, so it's mostly historians, I would say, that are sort of uh, get hung up about this is, you know, sort of a sanitized version of history. But I also think it's they want to do it because they want to make queer history reliable because of the lack of uh, sources, the lack of uh, um, sort of other ways in which uh, queer people could talk about themselves. They think that this gives power to the community. And one thing like uh, the publication of the Stonewall Reader, that was a sort of collection of first-hand accounts, unfiltered, it was also from the, I think, the New York Library, was also something that contributed to sort of diversify um, the sources, um, to sort of put more um, out there, uh, some some of these things had never been shown, for instance. The second question, I totally agree with, with you, is it's a political move, because if you say um, there is a, we have a Stonewall moment, um, it means uh, that is a powerful um, it's a powerful sort of wake up call. It's a moment in which you can tell people you have to remember this time because it never, nothing is going to be ever the same again or things will change from now on, which is not a bad activist move in itself. I'm not uh, necessarily against it um, as a strategy, but I worry that that becomes the only way in which we narrate queer history as if we always have the need, the crutch of the Stonewall narrative. Uh, but, you know, in some cases, there isn't a before and after. Things are messy. Um, you know, you see with legal developments, one day you have, uh, you know, uh, protection on paper and the day after you get beaten by the police. So, you know, it, it, I'm, I'm not sure that in many countries we can have that watershed moment where we say, well, from today onwards, things will be different because there's so many setbacks in terms of, you know, we see it also with anti-gender movements these days, you know, things can slide back very, very quickly. But it's an interesting question, you know, how do we allow room for uh, activist uh, uh, usages of this narrative without taking away from the agency of also saying, you know what, that's not for us. <laughs> you know, we don't want to fall into the Stonewall movement, and stone, Stonewall moment um, narrative. So, yeah, that would be my reply. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else have a question? Um, I think there are I, some comments in the chat. Yes, there are some comments. Um, yeah. So we've got Flo, um, who wanted to ask the LGBT history in Argentina started in the 60s. Um, yeah. Our first gay, our first gay organization was published yeah. in the 80s. Uh, yeah, Nuestro Mundo. Um, yeah. you knew about that, did you? Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and I, I don't have time. I didn't have time to present. But for yeah. instance, I even in Colombia, there was another, um, a group of people called Los Felipitos that started in the 40s and the 50s. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of different people who have done things in very difficult conditions uh, way before Stonewall um, and in situations of political oppression as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, thank you for pointing that out, Flo. Yeah, I'm not that Chris, knowledgeable about Nuestro Mundo, though. <laughs> <laughs> Chris um, said, Chris Day said that um, his question would be um, is part of the issue mm -hmm. issue about what our history is and how central Stonewall, uh, Stonewall is something that is reinforced by rainbow capitalism and the role of enterprise and world pride play in organizing mm -hmm. or managing pride events globally. Yes, mm, that's yeah, mm. that's a great that's a great question. Thank you. Mm. I think that um, this linear narrative is really needed for um, streamlining, um, you know, the proliferation of pride, because, you know, if we all come, if we are resting on the shoulders of those who rioted at Stonewall, then we can just copy and paste whatever we need to do. And I, I mean, I don't want to come across as anti-activist or anti-pride because I'm, I really love pride, but I also know that, uh, you know, this single narrative doesn't fit um, everybody's uh, experiences. 
and um, particularly in the context of rainbow capitalism, the, the, we could also see a sort of monetization of uh, the Stonewall narrative. You know, um, I, for instance, you know that awful movie that I mentioned in 2015, that wasn't an activist movie. I mean, it was an attempt to capitalize uh, by queer cis washing and whitewashing capitalize on queer history, to make it palatable, to make it accessible to a, a straight uh, cisgender audience, um, a middle class audience, um, particularly probably Western US centric. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are insidious um, mechanisms there. Um, I'm not saying that uh, everything is rotten and that Stonewall should be completely abandoned and dismantled. I would never say that. But we should exert some caution in the way in which we mythologize things. Because also, you know, in the way in which Stonewall has been mythologized uh, has also been made the very sanitized. So, for instance, you know, we could have conversations about the relationship between the patrons and the uh, the mafia that was running the bars, you know, this is something that is also been highlighted by some authors, you know, they have looked at the networks of uh, these underground bars in New York and elsewhere, or we could look at other forms of unsavory forms of activity, for instance, the side complete sidelining of sex workers from the gay liberation front, and uh, the speech of Silvia Rivera in 1973, mm -hmm. when she was attacked uh, on, the, on the stage of pride because she was saying, I'm here to fend for, you know, your trans sisters, you know, the sex workers and so forth. So Stonewall, the myth of Stonewall is also a clean myth that is uh, very conducive to, for instance, I don't know, putting it on a T-shirt or the, the advert for a sandwich or, you know, all those horrors that we have seen in the last few years with rainbow capitalism. So thank you, Chris, for your question. <laughs> That's true. Um, yeah, Alex Manson, um, he's got a question about social media, how social media and so, um, activism, social media and social media activism have contributed to mythologizing Stonewall and how can they also contribute to pushing back this um, homogenizing narrative or homocolonial narrative? Um, I, so that's another excellent question. Um, um, I think I mean, because obviously the 20, sorry the 50th anniversary of Stonewall happened in 2019, so we we were flooded with uh, all of these commemorations of Pride events of uh, you know the World World Pride in uh, in um, New York City. So I think that uh, in probably for younger generation, this uh, it's even more tempting to think about Stonewall as this mythical time where people stood up and that before Stonewall everything was horrible or no one dared to do anything. But you know, there's also, um, it's, it, it, I think it's through social media and through the emergence of alternative narratives, uh, um, there has been an attempt of centering other voices. Uh, for instance, you know, I've seen in the last few years a lot of discussions on the legacy of people such as Marsha P. Johnson that were also sort of you know, sidelined uh, in uh, some of the documentaries uh, together with Silvia Rivera. And um, there are also new archives and new perspectives that are um, um, also offered, you know, one of which I said was the Stonewall Reader, but it's not necessarily just that. Um, and just, uh, I think uh, the biggest uh, contribution to this is the um, multiplication of grassroots initiatives by people themselves who then go on to social media and talk about what they're doing with their own events. Because obviously they don't have to rely on the press. I mean, if you take, uh, for instance, press coverage of events uh, uh, when before social media, it was predominantly left to papers and TV stations to cover these events and they could spin the narrative in the way they wanted. But I think social media in that way obviously offers uh, um, tools to uh, complicate, sort of com complexify that question. And yeah, I mean, I think that also I would probably, I would probably, I would probably be a little bit cautious about social media in the other sense in, in relation to spreading this myth of Stonewall as if uh, unless you have this Stonewall moment or pride in your own country, there is nothing happening there, which is a bit of a homo-colonialist narrative. So, you know, if we want to take a, an extreme example, um, in the last few weeks, uh, you know, 
flying a queer flag on the rubbles in Palestine is an example of what should never be done in the name of queer people. So, you know, we, we, we can arrive to those kind of narratives which have nothing to do with the intent and spirit of Stonewall itself. So there's opportunities and there's also challenges um, in this uh, memorializing, mythologizations of pride. Mm, that's true. Does anybody have any other question? Want to raise their hand and, um, yes, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, I have many questions. So if we have time, then I'll yep. keep going. <laughs> Sorry. If I'm okay. No, I'm quite struck by, um, and I actually really like how you were emphasizing the kind of um, cleavages and frictions that existed and have always existed in the moment. And because I think often, and I think this, this is where there is a real, uh, I, I really like the contribution in the sense that you'd like have this, we, we often talk about how neoliberalism has really like, you know, whitewashed and kind of, um, cleaned up the history and the kind of move from liberation and, and, and um, as an idea and as a kind of philosophy to LGBT rights. And, um, but it seems like you're saying that actually this tension has been uh, always been there and it's just like different points in time where I guess it's been intensified to erasure, um, which I thought was really fascinating. And I, I, is, did I, I guess, I don't know if it's a question, but like, um, I wonder whether you could kind of highlight a little bit more of the early days, right? Of how this erasure happened so quickly, um, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> I think there is a dangerous narrative, uh, not dangerous, but you know, a bit reductive narrative that we sometimes hear, particularly when we hear discussions around uh, uh, alleged feminists who exclude trans people as if uh, you know that had never happened before um, and you know we sometimes think that you know we were all in unity living in bliss holding hands and hugging trees before you know um, the advent of uh, the so-called contemporary gender wars but the truth is that there is a toxic legacy within LGBT activism and there, it's one that we don't particularly want to look at and you know there's a um, um, some work by Griffith who looks at uh, the unsavory aspects of LGBT memory uh, in, in terms of activism, the parts of activism that we want to forget because they don't make us look good. Uh, so, for instance, the exclusion of black people from the LGBT movement, the exclusion of trans people, the exclusion of women, because obviously women were participating to the um, uh, meetings of the GLF, G Get, no, GLF, yes, the GLF. Generation Front. and then they was they started to feel extremely uncomfortable because of the misogyny and the ma macho culture that reigned during those meetings. Um, same with black people, same with disabled activists. So, and we we, I think there is sometimes, and this is probably one of the problems within the community itself, if we want to call it a community, that we find it really hard because of the ostracization that we live as queer people. We find it hard to look at the cracks that exist within our own communities. Um, and I saw at the, <clears throat> there is someone I don't remember who, but says uh, that we should probably think about Stonewall as the moment when those cracks emerged. Because before that, there wasn't really a necessity for talking about those cracks because everybody lived in fear in, in one way or another. Uh, but you know, the moment in which you go in the open and you start debating your positions, that's the moment where you start having disagreements. And uh, that, you know, the apex of that was, as I said, uh, one of the apexes of that was the discourse of Sylvia Rivera in 1973, when she was like, sorry, pardon my French, but she said, fuck you all. I've given my life for this movement and now you're giving me nothing back. So I think that, you know, this is a, is a broader problem that we have, I think, also to these days. So the, the idea of wanting to present a united front often means that we swipe under the carpet the problems that we should have addressed a long time ago, such as transphobia within the LGBT movement, that we have left it to, you know, um, fester um, unaddressed. And now, 23, we're still wondering why there are some LGBT LGB people who are transphobic, you know? Uh, so I think, you know, I don't know if it, that answers your question, <clears throat> but I think there is a, 
uh, <clears throat> sitting with the discomfort of uh, knowing that queer politics uh, can also be dirty is something that probably we should learn to do better if we want to win our battles of you know rights and recognition. <clears throat> Um, no, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Francesca, um, for your uh, questions. Um, I'm just looking into the uh, chat and see if there's any other question from colleagues or students. Uh, Sebastian um, wants to go for coffee, which to which Sebastian I'm Sebastian wants yes, to go for a coffee. coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, that's a great idea, Sebastian. Um, does anybody else have a question? to Francesca or a comment or I jump into and leave mine. Um, okay, so I'm jumping into before any other. Um, so Francesca, that was a lovely and uh, wonderful presentation, well informed and thought provoking really. Um, I did my own, the first research work I did and I published that in a book, it was about um, homosexuality, it, it was titled Homosexuality and Invisibility in Revolutionary Cuba. So yeah. as you can understand by that title, you touched upon so many issues, so many themes and topics and uh, um, and that, you know, that I addressed in my time. I looked into the work of homosexual writers and documentary film mm -hmm. um, documentary and filmmakers, Cuban filmmakers who had to live to New York. Um, and it was very, very interesting, that research I did. But I wanted to pose a couple of things, a couple of questions to you today. Um, I moved from that um, analysis of that political violence against homosexuals, and I looked into males. I only looked to males because of base and uh, had to focus on males. So I left women, lesbians, transsexuals behind, although I touched upon them at some point, but my main focus were um, males. And I was really surprised that they never, um, ever, or just barely talked about women, the invisibility of women, lesbians and transsexuals. They just focus on themselves. So I was really um, impressed by that. I looked into the narrative too, that's why I'm very interested in your approach to the narrative and the way things are told and who is telling those stories and how they give importance to that. And my question to you is about this narrative thing, whether you are going to look into that more in depth, um, in the also in the notion of the myth and the memory, which I also, I'm also uh, looking into in other research I'm doing at the minute. And my last question to you is, are you interviewing activists and people who were present in that event, mm -hmm. in the riots? Um, because it would be very interesting to hear their stories. It's a bit of touching, um, it's a bit of oral history too, and testimonials that you also talked about, which is, I was there and I can tell you on reflection how I, saying it has evolved that would mm -hmm. be very interesting are you interviewing anybody hey, so to answer that question no because this chapter is uh, as i said the laying foundation for yes uh, you know the book itself uh, i have interviewed 60 pride organizers uh, but I have interviewed them more on um, current challenges. Uh, so the, the bulk mm -hmm. of the book will discuss challenges around grassroots politics, disability and accessibility, environmental pro protection or environmental um, activism, um, human rights uh, and uh, commercialization and rainbow capitalism. Um, mm -hmm. But there is definitely, uh, it was very important for me to get a, an intersectional uh, approach to how stories are narrated. So I've tried to have a sample of activists who came from very different traditions, age cohorts, um, experiences, um, and uh, you know also locations within the global south and the global north as well. Um, but you know I think it's it's almost like a, a ulterior project, the one you highlight, it's, and it would be fascinating. And in relation to the question of invisibility, I mean, there is a long-standing issue with lesbian invisibility, queer women, also bisexual women invisibility. And it's one because all, that is often coupled with the fact that there is an explicit criminalization of uh, um, lesbian 
um, relationships or relationships between women in the same way that there is a criminalization of uh, male um, relationships. But at the same time, it is also true that the people who had the prestige, the particularly in the context of the Stonewall riots, were gay men. I mean, if you look at one of the most uh, paradigmatic books uh, of uh, the historiography, which is the Stonewall by Martin Duberman, Martin Duberman has the uh, testimonies by Silvia Rivera and, you know, um, another um, female black activist. But the ones where you really see the active, the sort of uh, actions happening, the sort of organization of uh, let's do this, let's tackle this problem, were the ones about Jimmy Forat or Craig Rodwell. So those were the people who actually had the power, who printed the press, who, you know, talked to the journalists. And, you know, we see it with the, you know, with the media. You, If you have the story, you spin the story. You know, if you have the microphone, you spin the story the way you want. And I'm not saying that they spun it in the wrong way, but they probably focused on what was most important to them. Um, to the point again that Silvia Rivera had to shout to, to be heard uh, because no one was taking her seriously. So, like people like Marsha P. Johnson, Silvia Rivera, they were subsequently interviewed like 10, 20, 25 years after. Um, so, I think itself that tells you whether we want to believe that Silvia Rivera was there or not, but not interviewing her when she was such a pivotal figure in um, early trans activism in the US with STAR, I think it's a, it's a bit of a, you know, it's a bit of a problem. Um, I don't know if that how you know, sort of answer the question. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it does. I mean, the, the question of invisibility and who's got the voice or then who is leading the narrative is always a bit tricky and controversial, isn't it? Because, yeah, for historians, but also for social scientists, um, and sometimes when we do interviews, et cetera, it's just not to give them any, the voice, because we're not giving anybody anything. It's just to use, to be used as a vehicle for, you know, yeah. to just for them to be heard or read in our um, articles and books, et cetera. But it's a big, big question, I think. And particularly as someone pointed out, I think in the global South, because all the discourse has been capitalized and led by as you said before, those people who had access to media, publishing houses, etc. So when doing my research about homosexuals in Cuba, I had to I had to travel to Princeton University because all these data and letters and some articles they were not even kept anywhere. Uh, they we had to go into the original material of the writers uh, because you know and and Renaldo Arenas who is a iconic. Um, homosexual writer and lots of people have followed him, him and uh, there is a um, film um, by you know um, he's um, I think he's, I think it's um, who, who is the um, um, well I don't remember though the the actor but it was nominated to Oscars and everything he used to say I'm gay I'm Cuban I I don't have papers in the United States so I've got all the all, all the possibilities to be ignored and invisibilized and silenced by the mainstream discourse about um, yeah. you know, activism, etc. So, yeah, I think it's a very interesting approach. Um, and someone mentioned before uh, Argentina and also Colombia. And, and, yeah, it is for further research instead to yeah. just explore. I mean, what is fascinating is that, you know, for instance, Mexico. Now, I now don't remember the year when the first march in Mexico happened, but the first yeah. time gay activists uh, or queer activists started to march was for the commemoration of the Cuban revolution. And, uh, you know, in countries like Colombia, for instance, or Brazil, uh, and also, you know, in European countries like Italy or France, uh, the first time they were marching, um, was probably not Italy, sorry, no, Italy was different, but France for sure. It was a for to commemorate the first May, so the International Workers' Day. It wasn't an autoc autonomous march, you know. So there are, you know, definitely some uh, different ge genealogies, different connections. But it, that also raises questions in relation to how uh, socialist and communist policies then, you know, ostracized, uh, um, you know, uh, gay and trans people within the the the, the global left, if we want to call it. 
with that. Uh, but it's interesting that, you know, for instance, you know, in Mexico, the first time it's to commemorate the Cuban revolution. Yeah, very interesting. Yes, we could be talking about that for months. And uh, yeah, we also, you know, we, uh, you know, I joined to, um, I joined Sebastian and we go, we should go for a coffee. And talk coffee. About <laughs> You're going to be with you. Um, so anybody else have any questions or something or some kind of observation <laughs> or comment to Francesca's wonderful presentation? Um, is there anything else that someone wants to, yeah, let's go for coffee, Sebastian, you and I, we are always ready <laughs> to go for something or a drink. Um, does anybody else um, want to say something to Francesca about her wonderful research? So when is the when will the book when will, will the book come out, Francesca? Um, I think it should come out in time for Pride Twenty Five, which is a oh, very rainbow capitalistic move from my part. But also it's an opportunity to inject some uh, sort of uh, polemical energies into Pride celebrations. <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, I'm, I'm writing the manuscript that should be done uh, in June uh, 24 and then one year of production, of course. Uh, but, you know, it's getting there. And also and with a lot of questions today, I feel like I have a lot to mull over. <laughs> well, yes, that always happens when you do your presentation of yeah. your research. You have, to, you know, lots of ideas and yeah. lots of things. Um, that that but that's fantastic and we will of course add it to our students reading lists and everything um we'll do a book lounge in the center and okay. that's great um so anybody anybody else want to say something to about francesca's to francesca um about her research anybody that's fascinating topic um so you know no okay so right so does any, do, do you want to say something, uh, Francesca? No, no, no. About just, your... just want to thank people for their wonderful questions. Yeah. Very thought provoking and uh, for being here. I really appreciated it and I hope that it was interesting. It was very interesting. And I invite you to perhaps do another seminar presentation if you need it next year to present another chapter if you find Absolutely. that it's very useful. I always find it very useful to do presentations about my research because, as you said, you always encounter uh, questions. And once we verbalize how what we're yeah. doing and how we're doing it, we re revisit those chapters. So it's yeah. very useful to. Yeah, just to open it to people and just um, come out of from your computer and actually verbalize and talk about it. Um, it's a very so. My last question to you, Francesca, before we just um, go, it would be: What are the main challenges you are finding while mm, writing or doing excellent. research? Yeah, I think the main challenges is to you know thinking about how mm. to particularly for this chapter it was how to select my sources. So I had the same challenges that historians themselves, I think, they had, uh, particularly because I was uh, very torn between doing justice to the legacy of Stonewall because I feel that uh, almost that reverence towards it. Be you know, it's, it's crazy because, you know, we have probably to some measure internalized that myth, you know? So it probably was a, a, a question for me to think about how do I counterbalance the overwhelming power of the uh, historiography of Stonewall with the narratives that shed the fresh light uh, without appropriating them? Because also I'm a white person from the global north. Um, so I, I was very, you know, very, very uh, con uh, conscious that uh, it shouldn't be like an appropriation, but a sort of like, you know, an opening the door to see, have you considered this, for instance? Um, I don't know if I've managed to, but it's something that definitely, I think, will continue this challenge throughout the book, because I'm trying to um, have these conversations in contexts in which I am not, I don't have lived experience of. And I think that's something that I will have to keep uh, in mind for the rest of my writing um exercise in the next few months <laughs> that's a big challenge isn't it just to select uh, your biography and everything it's a big challenge yes um totally sympathize with you <laughs> okay so any anybody else we just um will finish this presentation no 
No? Okay, so I thank everybody for attending today to Francesca's presentation. Have a look to the event we're running at the Global Diversities um, in collaboration with the um, Global Diversities and the World Youth Research Center, quite a long name, in collaboration with the Gender and Sexuality Group. Um, and there's a lot of there are a lot of events coming, um, also related to other areas not related to gender and sexuality, but we've got a symposium on women. In, in on January, we are now prepping that, and that will be, I think, hybrid. So you are more than welcome to come and attend this if you want to hear more about all the challenges that women encounter, um, et cetera, et cetera. So just uh, write to me if you've got any questions or you would like to, to present your research in, in this seminar series. As you can see, it's quite, um, um, it's done in quite a relaxed and constructive environment, so you are all welcome to, to join us. Thank you very much. I will stop now the uh, recording and um, I hope.